uh, you have a, a policy brief paper on the how the climate change uh, sub support should be in the conflict settings. What is the, the key takeaway for the, the reader of the your policy brief? When we were looking at the global funding architecture for climate change finance in conflict settings, it became very clear that most conflict affected settings are one, very vulnerable to climate change, but two, they don't have nearly any financing from the global funding regime. And even though there is increased attention and conversations about the importance of funding uh, climate change action in conflict affected settings, there are so many complications that get in the way in actually allowing that to happen. And one of the major reasons for that is because the majority of financing for uh, climate change action goes through bilateral loans to states. So if you have a country like Myanmar, where the Myanmar military is considered an illegitimate regime, which of course it should be, then there is no funding that is able to be channeled to that country. In our report, we really advocate for thinking sort of outside the box and for creating a specific sort of funding body within the current structure and architecture um, that is available that can actually really facilitate funding going to local organizations and local community groups. The key takeaway is a focus on localization, but rather than just talking about localization, let's actually put it into practice. Let's remove some of the sort of uh, financial requirements that make it so difficult for local organizations to get access to these global funds. But also, how big is the climate change financing gap is? Yeah, so I mean, in Myanmar, there is virtually no climate change financing. Um, and that is partly because, um, well, the main reason is because Myanmar is not recognized in the international community. So it's one of very few countries, um, another country being Afghanistan, and that's because Afghanistan is run by the Taliban government. We do not advocate in um, our research to fund any climate action through the Myanmar military or the State Administration Council. We really think that those, um, that funding can only contribute to further sort of violence against communities that people are already experienced. So we, we really advocate for working with local people, working with local organizations. There is some organizations, um, you know, that are really trying to think outside the box, who are trying to think about how can we support these local organizations and groups. Um, but they, I like in speaking, um, part of our uh, policy brief was actually based on interviews with uh, people working in the UN uh, and other bodies in, in inside Myanmar, right? And I, in talking to them, I can feel they are frustrated by these, you know, mechanisms that make it difficult to actually fund local organizations. They are trying, um, but, but because of the sort of structural arrangements in place, it makes it really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, the structural problems mm -hmm. is not only in Myanmar, but also in the global mechanism. Definitely, yeah. So, you know, like I said at the beginning of this conversation, uh, conflict-affected countries all over the world, um, research shows that they are the most vulnerable to climate change, but they actually receive the least amount of global funds for climate change action. And, you know, it's less than 5% of global, uh, global climate, ac um, climate action funds. And so you have the most vulnerable countries in the world not receiving really much money at all, and Myanmar is at the bottom of that. As people try to adapt and cope with climate change, and the reality is they're not coping. Um, a lot of the coping mechanisms are leaving, right? And so, you, for example, a lot of the communities we've spent time in, there are no young people, and that's partly because of the political violence. Also, the recent conscription law has um, you know, created a huge um, wave of migration of young people from rural areas but it's, it's also because of these like decades of structural violence against farming communities that forces people sometimes to sell their land when, when they have no other option. It's forcing people into really high layers of debt and that's partly because of the economic crisis as well. And so you have this situation where uh, people aren't coping and so they're leaving the country. Um, and you know, there really does need to be more of this thinking outside of the box. How can we actually, you know, better support organizations that are working on the ground, 
um, whether that's through cross-border sort of mechanisms and initiatives led by CSOs in places like Thailand or even in Mizoram in India. Of course, it's complicated. We know that there are all these sort of uh, structures put in place to make it difficult for, you know, donor money, for example, to go to go into those spaces. But this is where the flexibility needs to come in. And in our policy brief, we really advocate for sort of more flexibility in these um, in, in conflict affected areas. So this is, again, why we are really advocating to work with civil society, work with local people and organisations, get that funding into the hands of local people, because we know that both the state and also non-state armed groups can act in violent ways against people and the environment. And that's not to say that uh, some non-state armed groups aren't trying to put in mechanisms and policies to you know, better think about climate change. And especially if we put, look at places like Kareni, um, where they have you know, like a new government and systems and policies that they're trying to design to protect the environment and think about climate change. So you know, outside actors in the international community should be supporting these initiatives, right? Uh, what, what are the barrier for them to support the system that you said? I mean, so the main barrier is that um, most climate action funding goes through bilateral loans, right? So country to country loans. And if you're a small organization, you can't even get access to that, right? And then, you know, the next level is through these smaller um, funds in, in conflict affected countries. But a lot of the requirements are really difficult to meet. It also requires like a lot of technical expertise, um, you know, funding for people in your office to be, you know, to understand the language, how to write grant proposals, all of that. And so you, you end up with civil society organizations not necessarily even having the capacity to meet those requirements because maybe they don't have the know-how, maybe they don't have the time because they're actually they're you know, focused on looking after people. Um, particularly, I think in this moment, we know that most environmental sort of organizations and activists are focused on the environment, but they are also focused on humanitarian needs, right? And so we're talking about communities where there's huge IDP communities um, and really struggling to survive. So I guess, it's actually supporting these local organizations, giving them the funds, giving them support in any way we can so that they can access these funds. In, in Myanmar, during, through your research, what do you see about this linkage mm. of the climate change and politics? Yeah, so there is a really strong sort of body of work, particularly in what is known as political ecology research which really seeks to highlight um, the politics of climate change, right? People's vulnerability to climate change, it's not natural, right? Uh, this idea of a natural disaster and people's vulnerability is incredibly problematic because actually people's vulnerability to climate change and natural disasters is also related to governance. It's related to um, institutional frameworks that can support people when you know, disaster occurs, when a drought occurs, when flooding occurs, right? And if you have a country like Myanmar, which doesn't have these strong institutions and systems to support communities in these instances, then actually it really enhances people's vulnerability. And I think a really interesting part of our research is that when we talk with people about why, why do you think climate change is happening, right? And they really point to these issues that are, are political, right? So they point to deforestation, they point to mining, um, you know, they point to, uh, you know, increased uh, use of fertilizers, which has basically also come from state programs because traditionally people used um, cow manure for fertilizing their fields. And, and it's so political, right? Um, you know, people's uh, ability to respond to climate change and um, conflict and also disasters, if you have your land taken from you, from the military, then how can you actually survive, right? That's your food source, it's your, it's your livelihood. And as I said, you know, the way people are responding is leaving. Um, you know, uh, before the coup, a lot of people also were leaving to work in urban cities like Yangon. Um, but also we see, we see huge migration outside of the country. Um, and that is because of conflict, but it's also because these traditional ag agricultural livelihoods that people have always survived from, and it's, not, it's no longer possible to you know, feed your family just from agriculture alone. And that is because of this combination of conflict, long running histories of violence, land dispossession, um, and, and, and now also climate change, yeah.
What should be included in thinking for the policy chain as well as implementations in this um, for climate change financing support yeah. at the international level mm -hmm. as well as the local Burmese context, local governance level? Yeah. So there is, at the international level, there is increasing attention, as I mentioned, on, um, you know, uh, helping support um, for climate change action in conflict affected countries. And part of that is related to, you know, broader debates with securitization, right? So instability in one country has flow on effects for other countries, right? And we can also see that in Myanmar, right? The instability in Myanmar also has effects on Thailand, on China, etc. So the reason that the international community is thinking about it is because of these flow on effects. Um, and, you know, a civil war in one country doesn't just affect one country, right? It, it, it also impacts the globe, really. And so how, as they are thinking about how can they actually better support uh, climate change action in conflict affected states, there is a lot of discussion about, you know, what can we do to change these structures, right, to actually get funding into the hands, particularly in local communities. Um, and we really advocate for thinking about, okay, so in the humanitarian sector, we know that they can go into areas controlled by non-state armed groups. But because climate change funding is often in the same sort of, I guess, area as development funding, they don't go into areas controlled by non-state armed groups. And again, it goes back to these structures and systems that prevent uh, organizations from working in these spaces. But if you have a country like Myanmar, also Somalia, other parts of Africa, right, where large parts of the country is actually controlled by these non-state armed groups. So humanitarian actors can get in there. So why not climate change actors also getting in there, right? And, you know, there is a limit to how much funding there is as well. So that is another constraint. But we really think that if humanitarian programs are going into climate vulnerable countries, they should also be thinking about how can they integrate climate change into their programming, right? Rather than giving a bag of rice to people, how about actually giving them seedlings to plant rice so they can act and, and drought resilient rice, right? So they can actually feed themselves, right? Um, and, you know, it's, it's obviously much more complicated than that. And I'm not saying we have all the answers, but I really think like Myanmar is such a great example of where we can see the strength of civil society. And if we compare to other countries in the world, other conflict affected countries, Myanmar is so unique in how strong its civil society is, how strong the sort of indigenous led networks are. And, and, and I think like it's really clear for me working on this subject that like there are organizations and there are people that we can better fund, right? Um, it's just about getting them access to that funding. Thank you so much for giving your time, Dr. Chamber. Yeah. Thank you so much.